Forensic Science SA and the Police Minister to <coughs> identify uh, South Australia Police's commitment to National Pis Missing Persons Week, which uh, runs between 31 July this year and the 6th of August. National Missing Persons Week is, has been established nationally to raise awareness to reduce the number of missing persons and also to highlight the impact that missing persons have both on the missing person and also their family and loved ones. Um, one cannot imagine the effect of not knowing where a loved one is and as such the South Australian Police uh, heavily prioritise um, their response to missing persons. Between 2018 and 2021 in South Australia, we've averaged 36 missing persons per day. <clears throat> that averages out to about 12,900 missing persons per year. Fortunately, 50% of those people are located, located within 24 hours and 99% of those missing persons are actually located within a month. In July 2018, a major crime investigation branch with the missing persons investigation section <coughs> commenced an initiative uh, named Operation Persevere. Operation Persevere uh, came about uh, following the uh, successful implementation of Operation Persist, which was implemented to um, investigate cold case homicides. Persevere was established uh, for a number of reasons, uh, primarily to provide a structured <coughs> and consistent approach to the management investigation review of long-term missing persons and also unidentified human remains within South Australia. In July 2020, a national DNA and unidentified human remains project was established nationally and um, that project is currently complementing what the South Australian Police do with Operation Persevere. Operation Persevere draws on um, a vast number of experiences. It draws on uh, investigative experiences from major crime for previous investigations uh, national mission, missing persons initiatives. We seek assistance from external law, law enforcement agencies and also research from both national and international um, <coughs> missing persons sections uh, through the National um, Police Consultative Group on Missing Persons. Currently in South Australia, there are 147 long-term missing. Of those 147 long-term missing people, 55 are currently declared major crimes as they're deemed to be suspicious. 42 of those people are believed to be lost at sea and 50 people are believed to be missing on land. Since the implementation of Operation Persevere, uh, South Australian Police has investigated uh, 29 unidentified human remains and currently, um, I'll speak to it shortly, we've identified 11 of those unidentified human remains and we have 18 unidentified human remains that are currently under investigation. Operation Persevere, um, we rely heavily on our partners. It's a collaborative, collaborative approach between ourselves, Forensic Science South Australia, uh, Forensic Odontology, the State Coroner, <coughs> the National DNA and Unidentified Human Remains Project, and uh, also other national law enforcement agencies and overseas agencies if required. As part of the initiative, uh, to ensure that we have successful matches and we have familial samples. We've conducted a back capture of DNA and we currently have 80% of uh, familial DNA on the database to assist us in identifying unidentified human remains and missing persons should they be located. <coughs> Further, um, in relation to missing persons, there's a national missing persons database that was established in 2015 and the South Australian Police upload all of our data DNA and any other information that we have, for example, um, dental records and medical records to that system. Um, these investigations, we're treating them not dissimilar to a homicide investigation as a result of Operation Persist. They're given the same importance. We have forensic case meetings with Forensic Science SA and our interstate partners. We uh, review coroner's records, old files. We'll actually review previous media, media articles um, and other state held records to help us advance these investigations. Um, further, we're also using modern anthropological examinations and uh, forensic odontology examinations to assist us in identifying these missing persons and or unidentified human remains. As I said, we regularly hold forensic case meetings where we review the entire investigation with Forensic Science SA 
The reason we do that is we want to provide the greatest opportunity of success to identify the ident unidentified human remains or the missing person um, so that we can actually further that investigation. That may mean that we require assistance locally or, as I said previously, nationally and or internationally. Since March 2019, Operation Persevere has successfully resolved 11 unidentified human remain cases. The identity of six of those long-term missing persons has actually been um, established to the uh, requirement of the state coroner to enable a formal identification. And for those six missing persons, they were reported missing between 1976 and 2020. So it's quite a considerable time frame. Three of the people that we've identified are Mario Della Torre, who was reported missing from Wyala in 1976, and his remains were located in False Bay, north of Wyala, in April of 1977. A second gentleman was Keith Wilson, who was missing from Sejuna in July 1981, and his remains were located seven kilometres north of Sejuna in May of 1982. A third person, or a third man, is Stephen Kentwell, who was reported missing at Victor Harbour in January of 1981, and his remains were located at Coolawong Beach in November 1981. Those identifications have come about as a result of uh, DNA testing, uh, matching of forensic odontology uh, examinations, and also circumstantial evidence that points to the fact that they are the persons that we have identified. We've also identified four unidentified human remains as being of Aboriginal ancestry and through the Aboriginal community those remains have been returned for repatriation. We've also identified that one set of human unidentified remains was actually that of an animal, um, so we're able to discount those. Um, since February 2022 we've provided 12 subsamples of unidentified human remains to the uh, National DNA Project. Um, we intend on delivering further samples next week. With that testing, uh, we're extremely optimistic that we will obtain some information that will help us progress those investigations and hopefully identify who those persons are. <clears throat> There's a significant need for us to identify uh, unidentified human remains. Um, firstly, we need to identify uh, what further avenues investigations there are and also to provide families with answers as to why their loved ones have disappeared. And probably importantly, once we do identify those people, is to afford the deceased a dignified burial with their family. Often there's an innocent explanation as to why people go missing, and there's many reasons why people may, may go missing or may choose to go missing. Where we have unidentified human remains, it's, it's essential that we do identify those people so that we can actually assess whether their disappearance is in fact suspicious or whether it isn't. Um, if the death is identified as suspicious, we'll then declare it as a major crime or be investigated as a murder. What I'd like to say is that South Australia Police will continue to pursue all avenues of inquiries which are available um, in relation to investigating missing persons and unidentified human remains. With the unidentified human remains, no matter the age or the date of the human remains and or the missing person, how long they've been missing, um, families and loved ones shouldn't give up hope that we can't actually progress those investigations. Further, with advancements in technology and um, other forensic practices, uh, there will be opportunities that will present as time goes by. Specifically today, uh, we're seeking information in relation to all unidentified human remains and missing persons, but in particular, um, we have four sets of ident unidentified human remains where um, we have information that may assist may allow the public to assist us with their identification. One is a man aged about 50 years, located at Kings Beach, west of Victor Harbour in 1964. Another is a middle-aged or older man um, who was located near the Playford Highway, west of the airport on Kangaroo Island in 1983. The human remains of a young adult located at Woolwash Bay near Port Macdonald in 2004. In particular, that person had had surgery to an upper arm and they actually have a surgical plate in that arm. And a man aged between 25 to 50 years who was located near Mount Lofty um, in 2010, <coughs> that gentleman's had uh, restorative, restorative dental work, which we believed was conducted in either Japan or China, 
and we also believe that that gentleman is of Asian descent. We're also seeking information specifically into two missing persons. One of those is uh, Gregory John Michael Christensen, who at the time of going missing was aged 41 years. Uh, Gregory used the surname also of the family name of Paps. He arrived at Port Germain by bus um, on the 6th of January 2003. He stayed at a hostel um, for several days and then on the 7th of January he was last seen in Port Germain um, when he said he was going to go for a walk on the beach. Uh, he left his possessions at the hostel and on the 9th of January he was reported missing and he hasn't been seen since. Um, we've had age progression images created of Gregory um, and they are of him, how we believe he would appear at the time of his disappearance and also how he would appear today if he was age 63. The second missing person is Gintoutis Paul Stimsbrys, who was 35 years at the time he went missing. He was commonly known as Paul, although he would go by Gintoutis as well. He was reported missing on the 8th of August 1992 after he left his, left his home address at Gawler, West, sorry, Gawler River. He did not take any possessions with him on that day and um, nor has he contacted any family or friends since that time. This year marks the 30th year of his disappearance and uh, we're seeking information into his disappearance and whether anyone in the community can assist us with that. I'll now hand over to uh, Forensic Science South Australia Director, Lindsay Wild wilson Hello, thank you. At FSSA, we are pleased to be part of the team effort working with South Australia Police. Technology is forever changing and improving, and the techniques we use now are considerably more advanced than they were 5, 10, 15 years ago. We use uh, all methods available to support uh, the work of uh, SA Police in investigating these often tragic uh, cases to bring much needed closure to loved ones and the families and the family members of missing persons. It's important for us that we aid South Australia Police and the community in identifying the deceased so that their bodies can be returned to the families and we can give a name to the deceased. I would like to recognise the hard work of the FSSA scientists which allows them, enables them, to be able to provide information to the investigators. Thank you. Um, there are two points that I just want to take this opportunity to raise today, and the first of which is that in Missing Persons Week, um, we and the government remembers and feels for the families who miss their loved ones and long for answers. This is a difficult week. In fact, every day that that these families are seeking answers is a difficult day. But my message is to families who long for answers is do not lose hope. Um, do not lose hope because I can tell you and give you assurance that the resources of the extraordinary people at South Australia Police, at forensic and science organisations, both here in South Australia and right across the country, are devoting significant efforts and expertise to you and your family's answers. Um, I want to thank police and I want to thank scientific experts who dedicate themselves professionally to finding answers, to looking for um, clues and answers in, in often very difficult circumstances. And as we've heard today, whether it's a matter from 30 years ago or whether it's a matter from one year ago, um, the efforts of, of South Australia Police are dedicated to this cause and this week my thoughts um, are with the families searching for answers for their loved ones who are missing. Right. Um, a lot can unpack there, but I'll start with Greg. Yes. Um, you showed us some images of how he could look now. Do you believe that he's still alive? Um, <coughs> with all missing persons, it's really extremely difficult to establish if that is the case. Um, as I said earlier, there are many reasons why people may go missing. and it's really difficult if we don't have the community support or we don't have other people that may now associate with people or mix with these people um, to assist us it's often a very very difficult answer uh, to give so I, I honestly don't know and you said that you'll be sending um, you'll be 
12 tests in February 2022? S since February 22, we've sent 12 uh, samples of unidentified human remains and in state. What has that found so far? Anything? No, so <coughs> um, with that testing, it's quite complex, and I'll, um, if there's any specific questions, I'll hand over to Lindsay. But we are waiting now on results as to how we can progress those investigations. And so next week you're sending more away? We're sending another further, a further sample, which will be 13, correct. Can, uh, can you elaborate on any of that? No. How important are some of these sort of characteristics you've identified here with these four profile, profiles that you've given us today? Um, how important and vital is that information for someone to perhaps come forward? Yeah. Um, with any missing person investigation, um, no matter how insignificant some may, someone may think the information is that they hold, it's really important that they actually provide that to the police. Um, without inf that information, it may be one piece that we're missing um, that can actually assist us to progress that investigation. So for example, the, uh, the remains that have the uh, medical plate, someone may know that they have a relative who had had some form of surgery uh, back around that time or prior to the time that we located the remains. And that, that's significant because that will then allow us to actually ascertain or conduct further testing to see if we can identify who that person is. And these are very specific characteristics, aren't they? What's another example? Um, for example, the gentleman that was found at Mount Lofty, um, so we've, with all these investigations, we ha do have to think very broadly. We've made inquiries um, with odontologists. We've identified that the nature of the work that has been done is most likely in Japan and or China. And testing has suggested that that person may also be of Asian descent. Um, so, so once again, if a loved one or someone knows someone that's had dental work conducted overseas, and they have gone missing, if they can come forward, any little bit of information may assist us in progressing these investigations. And just to confirm, this is new and vital information in these cases? Correct. Um, when we talk about Mario, Keith and Stephen, was that recently that you've been able to connect the dots? Yeah, that, that, that has been recently. So within the last couple of months? No, in the last 18 months. Um, as with all these investigations, as I said, we can obtain DNA evidence or um, dental records, but circumstantially we still often have to show that that is the person to ensure that the coroner has sufficient evidence to actually form uh, the opinion that that is the person we've identified. And last week there were some remains found down near the Lee's Town. Yes. Do you have any updates on that? Um, currently we're still waiting on the identification of that person. Um, and we're hoping that we'll have that identification completed um, in coming days or early next week. And you might, this might be a question for forensics, but can you talk us through the process of once you do find those remains, the end point to how they could be identified? From a forensic perspective, um, if the bodies or the, or the human remains is in sufficient condition to conduct a post-mortem, then we'll do that, and a pathologist uh, specialising in that area will undertake that examination. If the remains are skeletal, then we have an expert anthropologist who can um, examine the bones and identify uh, things such as uh, human um, uh, possibly uh, the, the sex of the individual, height, um, perhaps some ancestry information, uh, injuries, those sorts of things, and we can put that information together. The pathologist similarly could do a very similar work, cause of death, uh, and give that sort of metadata information about the bodies. Uh, from there, we could do a DNA analysis, um, and so we can analyze uh, and that can give us more information about an individual. Uh, we can uh, potentially search the National DNA Database to see if we could uh, establish a link uh, to a, an individual, or perhaps um, we could put it on the uh, National Missing Persons Database and do a familial link uh, to potentially identify uh, a relative. Uh, from there, we can use most uh, more specialised techniques uh, such as uh, markers that indicate ancestry or geographic origin of the individual. 
Um, and from there you go into highly specialised techniques that are sort of more suitable in, in very specific cases. Um, so essentially we can go through various, various processes to apply uh, forensic disciplines. Um, if there is a, um, uh, something with the body, such as um, a paper or a document, we could do document analysis on it. Um, we can also look at uh, things that are in clothing, such as um, potentially um, trace elements, uh, fibres, uh, paint, those sorts of things. So we, we take uh, these, unfortunately, these deceased, and uh, we put everything at our disposal um, in all of our forensic techniques to do whatever we can uh, to identify the individual. And generally, is there a timeline on that? How long an identification takes is entirely, entirely dependent on the deceased uh, person um, in the sense of the information that is available. Uh, we can start off with things uh, that are sort of more quicker, if you like, in terms of identification process. Um, but if the individual isn't on the database, then we don't have a sample to match. And so you need to go through the process. So it can be highly complex and it can take uh, quite a long time. And you're almost um, waiting for a family member to think that that person might be their loved one and submit a sample for testing. That's why it's really important for families that if they have a missing person, that they do contact their police and submit a DNA sample for comparison. Brett, was there any suggestion in these four profiles? I'm assuming that it's natural causes and that's our place of definitely Yeah. Um, no, with all unidentified human remains, it's very, very difficult to say what has occurred to them. Um, that's why it's paramount that we actually can identify who these people are. Once we know who the person is, that can actually assist us to identify whether the circumstances of their disappearance are suspicious. With that, without that, it's very, very difficult. Um, and that's why, as I said, um, a number of these unidentified remains date back to 1948. And it's essential that we do get the information we require from the community uh, to assist us to actually identify whether those circumstances are suspicious. More importantly, actually provide answers to a family who has questions and then as I stated earlier, it's one can't imagine how difficult it would be to have a loved one that is missing and you're not knowing where they are or whether they're safe. Um, but should we locate them, we can identify them. But then, as I said, it, it allows the family and the deceased to have a dignified burial. With the Mount Lofty remains, do you, have you been contacted um, Japanese or Chinese police just to check if that's Yeah, we've, um, we've been, we've done a lot of work both nationally and internationally, to ascertain who, the, who these people are. Um, so, as I said, we're, we're aware that those dental procedures have occurred overseas, um, but realistically, we need to, we still need information to help us because that person may have been a visitor, they may have been travelling with someone in South Australia, um, they may, you know, someone must know that they're missing. Um, no matter who the missing person is, someone would have an awareness, a loved one or a friend would be aware that their friend is missing. And of course you're hopeful that none of these four bring about another investigation of anyone of possible murder investigation. Oh, absolutely. Um, with any of these investigations we hope that the, uh, the disappearance isn't suspicious. Um, but as I said earlier, we're treating all these unidentified human remains no differently. Um, with the process we apply, as if it was a homicide investigation. And should it go that way, we'll, uh, we'll ensure all of South Australia Police's resources are put into it to investigate it. Can we get any general comments on what's unfolding at West Beach at all, just what we know so far? Yeah, no, I, I, I have no awareness, so I won't be commenting on that. Yeah, so, if I could just uh, uh, get it, your thoughts um, on an unrelated matter. From last night with police by Rusty, do we have an update on the dog? And uh, can you talk us through um, the protective equipment that uh, has, has come into effect there? Yeah, um, I've uh, been in communications with the police commissioner today, where I've sent my thoughts and thanks and best wishes to to, to both Rusty as well as the injured say pole officer. There are two things we know. Um, I wouldn't want to speak for the um, for the officer themselves, other than that I'm advised that they are in um, good health and that Rusty 
was quite frankly um, saved because of the protective equipment that, that the dog was wearing, a stab proof um, vest, and not dissimilar to the um, same stab proof vests that the Malinowskis Labor government is rolling out as part of our first budget. Um, any aggression, any assaults um, towards police, towards police dogs is unacceptable. It offends the community and it is deeply offensive to what is um, a general sense of trust and, and support for our police from our community. It's outrageous and I expect that um, the full force of consequences will be forthcoming on the individual involved. Joe, I guess this is just an example of you know, the dangers that police officers are faced with every day. Every day? Every single day that a police officer dons their uniform, or maybe it is a suit in the case of detectives and support um, um, officers, is a day that they're putting themselves at risk to protect the community of South Australia. Um, I thank them for their service. I thank them for the sacrifices that, that they make. But I also say unequivocally that assaults and aggression towards our police, towards our frontline emergency services workers, or in fact, in fact, um, aggression in, um, in the types that we've seen across the COVID pandemic towards hospitality and retail workers is deeply unacceptable and we just won't cop it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry.